Good afternoon. I'm so very pleased to see so many of you online with us today. Thank you for your continued enthusiasm for the work of the Smithsonian. I am Colleen Moore, Assistant Director at Friends of the Smithsonian, and along with the entire Friends of the Smithsonian team, I would like to welcome you to our curator lecture featuring the National Portrait Gallery's The Atwin 2019, American Portraiture Today. This lecture is rescheduled from our event planned for April. We are pleased that this new virtual format allows us to host so many more of you from across the country. Though we would love to be able to go through the galleries, the curators will take us on a virtual tour with images of the works of art on display while sharing insights into the exhibition. Before I introduce today's program and speakers, I am going to go through a few details about how the webinar will work. First, we are recording this session. The recording will be made available for future viewing as well. We are also pleased to be offering live closed captioning for this event. To enable this feature, click on closed caption, which should be on the far right of options. If you want to change your captioning options during the presentation, you can return to this button to turn it on or off as you choose. Today's webinar is being conducted in listen and view only mode, which means your audio is muted and cameras disabled. With so many of us on the call today, we thought it would make for a more seamless experience. We do still want to hear from you. If you have questions for the curators, please use the Q&A feature located in the bar at the bottom of your screen to send questions you have during the presentation. My colleague, Deborah Heller, will collect them and pose the questions to our curators at the conclusion of their presentation. And now for some background on the show and to introduce our presenters. The National Portrait Gallery's triennial Outman Boucherver Portrait Competition celebrates excellence in the art of portraiture. It is the realization of Virginia Atwin Boucherver's gift to the Smithsonian and the nation, a testament to the transformative power of one individual to make an impact. Mrs. Boucherver saw the endowment of a portrait competition at the National Portrait Gallery as a way to benefit artists directly, and the endowment as a unique opportunity to fill a void in the American art world. Every three years, artists living and working in the United States are invited by the museum to submit one of their recent portraits to a panel of experts. The selected artworks reflect the compelling and diverse approaches contemporary artists are using to tell the American story through portraiture. Our two speakers today are Taina Carrigal and Dorothy Moss. Dorothy Moss is curator of painting and sculpture at the National Portrait Gallery and coordinating curator of the Smithsonian Women's History Initiative. She directed the 2013, 2016, and 2019 Altman Boucherver portrait competitions. In 2015, she initiated the Portrait Gallery's first performance art series, Identify, an ongoing series which has included 10 commissioned performances by internationally recognized artists. Taini Carrigal is curator of painting, sculpture, and Latinx art and history at the National Portrait Gallery. Her scholarship focuses on Latinx and Latin American art and its institutional and market validation, as well as on the recovery of histories suppressed by colonialism. Since her hiring in 2013, she has significantly increased the representation of Latinx historical figures and artists at the Portrait Gallery, bringing approximately 200 new works into the collection. And she will be the director of the Atwin in 2022. And now I am pleased to pass the program on to our curators. Thank you so much and welcome everybody. We are delighted to be here um, with such a, a wonderful our audience today, which includes members of the Outwin Bucciver family. And I'd like to extend a special welcome to them. This exhibition is the result of our triennial competition, which was the vision of Virginia Outwin Bucciver. Mrs. Bucciver believed in the power of portraiture and she believed in keeping the art of portraiture alive. She was a docent at the National Portrait Gallery for over 20 years, and she loved history and biography and the way that uh, the convergence of the two happens with portraiture. We're deeply indebted to her for not only endowing this competition, but for really invigorating a contemporary art program at the National Portrait Gallery. 
which includes the Portraiture Now series, our performance art series, Identify, and many, many um, initiatives that we are undertaking as we really want portraiture to become a way for communities to uh, come together, a way for dialogue to unfold around important issues in our nation and our world. And so we are deeply grateful to Mrs. Buchiever for sort of initiating um, uh, the relevance of portraiture at the National Portrait Gallery um, and throughout the world, really. I am the director of the 2019 competition and I took on the role of directing the competition from our chief curator, Brandon Fortune, who initiated the triennial with Mrs. Buchiever back in 2006. And uh, as director, I have thought very carefully about the strategic goals of our museum and how this competition fits within those goals. And so with each competition, the rules change to reflect where we are going as an institution and where our curators and historians um, are, are heading in terms of how we present portraiture, um, not only to reflect history, but to reflect the current moment. Uh, the competition began as open to only painting and sculpture, and it has since expanded to include performance art and other time-based media, including video portraiture. Um, and it's basically become a way for us as curators to keep our eye on artists who are not only at the height of their careers, but also emerging artists who we get to learn about through the entry system. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I echo Dorothy in her recognition of the Outland Buchiever family and of Virginia Outland Buchiever. It's an absolute pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, one of the starting points of every cycle of the triennial portrait competition is to select the jury panel that will ultimately select the finalists that will be on view in our galleries. And uh, this panel is always comprised of four outside members of the arts community and three members of our internal National Portrait Gallery Curatorial Committee. We always strive to include a broad range of voices in the art field that um, are versed in different mediums of art, uh, that are representative of different regions of the country, different communities, and so this year, the outside jurors were Byron Kim, who is artist and senior critic at Yale School of Art, very well known for his conceptual portraiture. Harry Gamboa Jr., who's an artist, writer, and a faculty member of the California Institute of the Arts. He is a very well known performance and a photographer artist from the Chicano community as well. Lauren Haynes, curator of contemporary art at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. And Jefferson Pinder, who is an artist and professor of sculpture and contemporary practices at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And from within our curatorial staff, the competition was juried by Brandon Brain Fortune, our chief curator, Dorothy Moss, and myself. The exhibition um, draws a lot of attention. And this year we had 2,675 entrants. The entries were at a very high level. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the result of the last competition in 2016 um, drew a great deal of press because Amy Sherald was the winner of that competition and her commissioned portrait uh, as her first prize um, was the portrait of Michelle Obama, which has now become an iconic portrait in the history of art. That actually is a result of this competition. Not many people realize that, um, that those, the competition and that commission are tied together. So we're very proud of the way that this competition has risen in visibility and, um, and that it draws such um, extraordinary artists from all over the country. 
there were uh, 14 states represented and the 46 finalists who were chosen. You'll see uh, on your screen the diversity of media. And as I mentioned before, for the first time, we featured a performance artist in this competition. And here are the names of the finalists. Um, this becomes like an alumni network. Over the years, artists who have been in the competition become connected. Some help each other find jobs and gallery representation. Some find their way back to us uh, in exhibitions or we end up commissioning some of these artists for portraits for the National Portrait Gallery's collection. So this is a really incredible network and a way not only for artists to lift each other, but for us to celebrate these artists and what they are doing um, in terms of keeping the art of portraiture relevant and alive. And just to take you behind the scenes here, um, the jury process happens over three rounds. We narrow down those several thousand entries to approximately 80 semifinalists. And then the outside jury and our jurors meet in person here in Washington, DC um, at an undisclosed location where we bring all those semifinalist works and we look at them in person. Um, this is a photograph of that final jury day, which is very intense, but incredibly thrilling and exciting. It's the dream of uh, an art curator and art historian working with contemporary artists because um, really what we do that day is stand in front of the art and have uh, very profound conversations and debates around all these works and what they say, what they express until we have a selection of finalists who will comprise the exhibition itself. The jury process results in um, about 40, 40 to 50 finalists who are chosen for the final exhibition. And we also award three major prizes and we commend four artists. All the prizes have a monetary award. And the first prize this year, for the first time, went to a Latino artist. His name is Hugo Crossweight, and he is a native of Tijuana, but he lives between San Diego and Tijuana. He won with his wonderful stop motion, hand drawn animation, a portrait of Berenice Sarmiento Chavez. We're going to take a look now. Yeah. 
Cartagueras, buenas tardes, Dios los bendiga, los cumplidos, muchas gracias, buenas tardes, buenas tardes, buenas tardes, buenas tardes, buenas This book really is inspired in the story of Berenice Sarmiento Chavez, who is a woman that um, Hugo Crossway made, uh, met on the streets of Tijuana selling trinkets, and he struck a conversation with her, and she told him about her story of immigration. And so he wanted to honor her by drawing that story, by bringing that story to life and to depict the, to hu humanize, if you will, hot button topic in politics that has a very human side and is um, full of very human consequences of danger and precarity. We also have a People's Choice Award. Um, every, when the portrait competition opens in the space, we have kiosks available on site where people can vote for their favorite portrait and uh, they can also do so from home on our website. This time, our People's Choice Award went to the conceptual photographer Adal, also known as Adal Maldonado from Puerto Rico, for his photograph, Muerto Rico, from his series, Puerto Ricans Underwater, or Los Ahogados, where he photographed people he knows um, in his bathtub underwater to evoke the feeling of suffocation brought about by the economic crisis in Puerto Rico, which was then exacerbated, exacerbated by Hurricane Maria. Sheldon Scott is a um, Washington DC based performance artist, installation artist and photographer who was originally from South Carolina and the Gullah Geechee region of coastal South Carolina. His family um, has always lived on the plantation where his ancestors from West Africa were enslaved. His mother still lives on this property. And he submitted a portrait titled Portrait Number One Man. And what you're looking at here is a still from the video um, piece that accompanied the performance. For the first 10 days of the exhibition, Sheldon Scott performed from sun up to sundown, um, husking rice by hand just outside the exhibition galleries. He um, knelt during the performance. Sometimes he would stand up, but he was on a platform covered in indigo dyed burlap. Uh, there was a 19th century scale next to him where he would place each grain of rice one by one. And over the course of the performance period, visitors would come and spontaneously leave gifts for him. Um, some people left fruit and other talismans um, to show their support of him. There was a comment book where people could write comments. Uh, many people expressed deep gratitude to him for honoring not only his own ancestors, but their ancestors and telling a story that is not visible in our early collections. A lot of what this competition does is to make absence visible. Um, our early collections are filled with portraits, mainly of white men who held land and uh, were uh, wealthy and honored for their contributions to American society and culture, yet that leaves out a lot of people who made very significant contributions, including enslaved people who built the National Portrait Gallery's building. It's the third oldest federal building in Washington. So we're very proud that this exhibition is part of a series of contemporary programs that brings, um, that makes absence visible and recognizes those who may not be represented in our early collections. One of our favorite things about the portrait competition is how um, the very 
process of looking through thousands of entries and selecting the work that will be part of the exhibition draws attention to the issues that artists and the whole nation is grappling with. And so it's very interesting to see theme threads through the competition, through the work of these artists. Um, Sheldon Scott's work, whom Dorothy just discussed, and the work that you see on this slide represents the thread of a thread that we saw that was very apparent in the show, uh, addressing the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow, system, systemic racism, and Black Lives Matter. And here, well, the three works address that topic. We have a photograph, a portrait of the Ray McKesson, one of the most prominent voices of the Black Lives Matter movement by Queen Russell Brown. A photograph of Brian Stevenson uh, by Joshua Kogan. And he is, it's, it's at once an individual and a collective portrait because Brian Stevenson is standing in front of one of the most um, moving features of the legacy museum that he created uh, on the history of slavery and racism. And these are 800 jars that contain the soil from lynching sites across the nation. Um, so the photographer was very intent in showing the work, in honoring the work of Stevenson on racial justice, but also in honoring and remembering all the people who died as victims of systemic racism. And then we have this wonderful gem of a painting titled Legacy by Wade McIntosh, who won the third prize along with another work. So for the first time this year, we had a tie for the third prize. And this portrait is of his fellow friend and portraitist, um, Jordan Castile. And it honors the legacy of social justice activism in her family. Jordan Castile is the granddaughter of Whitney Young Jr., uh, very prominent, uh, important civil rights leader. For the first time in the competition history, we changed the rules to open the uh, competition up to paintings and drawings and sculpture, conceptual art that looks back at history. In the past, the rules um, stipulated that the portraits had to be made from direct life encounters. But as I mentioned, when we are thinking about how this uh, exhibition might relate to the permanent collection, we want to fill in gaps in our collection with representations of historical subjects who are not represented in the collection. So these two artists entered portraits that look back at history on um, the left of your screen, as you face your screen, you see a portrait by Deborah Roberts of the youngest uh, person who's ever been electrocuted in an electric chair and put to death that way in South Carolina in the Jim Crow South. This is a horrifying story um, that we felt was very important um, to, to tell in our collection, in our uh, presentation of this exhibition and it's part of a larger series. Um, you see the young boy is wearing um, clothes that are too large for him because he was so young. He's also uh, wearing um, shoes that are too big. He's is sitting on what she's trying to reference here is a stack of books that he had to sit in in the chair. So this is a, a horrifying story of systemic racism and the legacy of lynching. And this is um, the image that graced the invitation to this event, Trailblazer, a Dream Deferred, a wonderful photograph by Genevieve Gagnard, uh, who is a performance artist and also a photographer who approaches photography as a performer. Here, she is dressed in 19th century garb and she's carrying a portrait of Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy. Um, and as if she was happy, um, as if she had found a sign of uh, future solidarity in the world that she was bringing back to her 19th century people to be hopeful. And then this wonderful photograph by Larry W. Cook, Fatherhood II. Uh, Larry Cook has been for some time photographing uh, African American families. 
and black fathers and their children. And um, one of the really moving aspects of this photograph is the how the child seems to be protecting her father with her hand on his chest. This um, artwork is a portrait of James Baldwin, one uh, of great um, writer who is a main source of inspiration for many, many contemporary artists. It is a um, scaled down version. If you, if you had the opportunity to visit the exhibition and if we're lucky enough to open before the exhibition comes down at the end of August, you will see that this is an installation piece. It is made out of polymer clay faceted dots and it has this incredible quality of iridescence. Um, it is a portrait of James Baldwin by Nakisha Dured, an uh, important, very prominent DC artist who does a lot of public work. She's an alumna of Duke Ellington School and also a professor of art there. And she was invited to create a, a work of art for the common space, for the cafeteria space of Duke Ellington School. And she decided to create this portrait of James Baldwin, who was unapologetic about his queerness and his blackness and whose work she first read while studying at Duke Ellington. She wanted the student body of Duke Ellington to have that same experience of affirmation that she had when she was a student there by walking in front of, every, of that portrait every day. This is a portrait by Fort Worth, Texas based artist Cedric Huckabee. It's part of a series called Our Lamentations. And um, in the series, he has painted uh, people from his community wearing mourning t-shirts. Each of the subjects from the series have lost a loved one due to racial inequity. Um, in this case, his friend Crystal had lost her father, who you see on the shirt. So it's a, a double portrait. Um, and his death was caused by lack of health care after being bitten by a poisonous spider. In the series, he often presents the subjects in front of quilts made by his grandmother or great-grandmother or his wife's grandmother um, as a reference to not only the tradition of quilt making in African-American communities, but also as a symbol of stained glass and the spirituality and strength that comes from faith. Another prevalent theme in the show was immigration. And you could see that um, already represented with the work of Ugo Crosswaite. Um, here on this slide, we also have the work of Patrick Martinez, an artist from Los Angeles who addresses the tensions um, that, that are part of multicultural life in a global city uh, as Los Angeles. And he often incorporates architectural elements, um, in this case, we have uh, and, you know, different sorts of materials, such as styles, different sorts of uh, styles of painting that look very urban. And this portrait is a memorial portrait to Claudia Patricia Gomez Gonzalez, who was uh, a woman from, Maya woman from Guatemala who crossed the border in 2018 and was shot mortally by a U.S. Customs and Border Protection Aid border protection, protection agent in Rio Bravo, Texas. Um, Patrick Martinez wanted to rescue, to recover her story and to draw attention to the great perils and the precarity of many immigrants. And this is a video portrait by Shimon Addy, who's based in New York City. He's a high profile artist who works in photography and video. And what you're seeing on the screen is actually an image of the installation when it was uh, projected on a barge going down the Hudson River during the 2018 UN Assembly meeting. Um, in the exhibition, 
we show the video portraits, which you see one of those here. There's a series of LBGTQI community members who were um, refugees and sought asylum in New York and around New York. So you see each of their faces emerge as they walk towards the camera and they stare at the viewer. It's a really beautiful and intense piece where it's installed at eye level so that you actually come eye to eye with each of these individuals. Um, and it really, to me, speaks to the power of this exhibition as a way to make visible the people who are often not seen, who feel unheard, um, and who are not necessarily represented um, in portraiture. And here we come face to face with them, look them in the eye and recognize every human being and the dignity that each human being carries. Continuing with this theme of immigration, we have our second prize winner, Sam Coleman, with a photograph of Jesus Serra, dishwasher. And this is part of a series titled Working America that Sam Coleman, who is a documentary photographer, um, documentary and artistic photographer who um, works a lot in themes of democracy, um, American democracy and civil rights, um, and their manifestation in Los Angeles, which is his home city. Uh, it's a series that he started in 2016 when he started noticing this discourse that was on the one hand um, praising workers and on the other hand deriding immigrants and he looked around himself and he said well every person I know around me in um, all sorts of small businesses in LA um, so many employees are immigrants and he and some of them second third generation and he wanted to honor them and to document them. And he created this series where he went around bakeries, uh, shoe shops, tailors, documenting the people who worked there. This is Jesus Serra, who's a dishwasher. You can see a, in, the, in the local bakery where Sam Coleman buys his bread. It's a very dignified composition um, with uh, you know, this triangle at the center and uh, Jesus Serra in a very commanding position of honor and um, dom complete domain of his um, of his realm there and pride in what he does. Another theme that emerged in the entries um, was um, representation of workers and um, not only in rural America but in cities. And, and here you see a portrait by Daniel Sintofanti of his father um, in Youngstown, Ohio, in um, uh, the Heinz Steel Fabrication Plant where his family has worked for generations. And the plant had just moved to a new location where there was a lot of surveillance. And Daniel took this photograph of his father in the middle of the night to recognize that his father is um, someone who is working round the clock and is often feeling like he's being watched and observed from above. And that's a change in the culture of the way that generations in his family had worked in the plant. Uh, Daniel wanted to document that change. And then on the right, you see a portrait of a man named Chance and his son, Gus who are in the Dakotas, in the Western Dakotas. And the artist wanted to, Carl Corey, wanted to capture rural life um, and these long traditions that have been passed down in generations of family that are still happening today. Yet you might look at this and, and think of a 19th century genre painting, which is what the jury thought of this when we saw it come through the entry. So it was a bit surprising to learn that this is a contemporary scene that happens daily. And um, we were very mindful of representing not only um, the East and West Coast major cities, but all across America, the kinds of um, lives that people live each day, especially those who may not 
feel heard right now. Um, this is another representation of rural America. This is Josephine in front of the Rest Haven Motel where she lives in Oklahoma. And it's a very large scale drawing in graphite and charcoal by its life size by Joel Daniel Phillips, who is a master drafts person. He actually was a prize winner in the 2016 competition and artists are allowed to enter multiple times. And um, as long as they didn't win first prize, they can continue to enter the triennial. So Daniel is a former prize winner in the Outwin. And he said he saw this woman uh, as he was driving on the highway, he took the exit, uh, came back around and asked if he could take her photograph. And as they engaged in a conversation, he realized that she was also an artist and um, they talked about making art and found connection there. And she agreed uh, to his making a portrait of her. So here he is, uh, here she is um, in that moment where he found her and they engaged in a conversation. Another theme that emerged through the show was the individual experience of active members of the military and veterans. And representing this topic here, we have a portrait of, uh, by Luis Alvarez Flore of his best friend um, titled Hidden Wounds. Uh, his friend uh, joined the Navy and was in, two, in several tours of Iraq and Afghanistan. And when he came back, um, Luis recounts the experience of meeting him. Um, Juan Carlos Arguelles is his name, the way and realizing that his friend um, was profoundly, was the same, but he, he was profoundly changed and that he had some experiences that those of us who have never had that experience of combat will never understand. And then we have a portrait of Specialist Murphy by Julianne Wallace Sterling, uh, who lives in Oakland, uh, California. This is a, portrait that came out of um, the order by the Department of Defense in 2015 uh, to open up the possibility of combat jobs to women. And Julianne Sterling asked herself, well, what, is, what, what notion do I have of female combatants? And she realized that she, she didn't exactly know what, how, that would manifest. And so she put out an ad on Craigslist asking for volunteers who had this experience. And that's how she met Specialist Murphy who came to pose for this portrait, which represents her individuality as a, as a woman in uniform. Another theme that emerged in the entries uh, was a representation of LBGTQI uh, plus communities. And this is a photograph by photographer Jess Dugan, who is based in St. Louis, of her friends Jamie and Anne. Um, Jamie was uh, undergoing um, breast cancer treatment and wanted Jess to document the process of her healing. She is also just to get included in an upcoming exhibition that Taina and I are curating with uh, two of our colleagues, Leslie Urania and uh, Robin Asselson called Kinship, where we look at different forms and configurations of family life. And that will open in 2022 at the National Portrait Gallery. So some of these artists in the Outwin, um, as I mentioned before, return to us to be part of exhibitions and that's always um, exciting. And this is a, a painting by David Antonio Cruz titled The Boys Don't Play Nice with Anyone, Portrait of April and June. David Antonio Cruz is a multimedia artist, a fantastic painter who um, addresses the lives of LBGTQ black and brown people in his community. And so he has been making portraits of, uh, of people in his community who are in relationships. And I particularly love this portrait because of the assertiveness of the gaze of 
the sitters. They're inviting us into their private space, but they're looking back at us in a very assertive way. Um, they're not there for our consumption or our scrutinizing. They're there to make their presence known. This is a large scale um, cut paper portrait by Antonius Ten Bui. It's titled Vanguard and it honors Aidan Khan Nguyen, who is Antonius's mentor and also the founder of a very important um, queer zine, queer Z Vietnamese zine titled Vanguard and also the founder of the Queer Vietnamese uh, Film Festival. Another theme that emerged it was a uh, focus on today's youth. And this is a portrait by uh, former actress, Kate Capshaw, who's uh, been making a series for many years now of homeless youth around Los Angeles. And her process involves meeting with each individual teen, getting to know their story, listening to them, and once a comfort level is reached, she offers to make their portrait from life sittings. So these were previously shown in a youth shelter in Los Angeles. Um, and she purposefully creates a um, ambiguous backdrop in order to focus on each individual and to make them hopefully see themselves out of their current context and imagine what life might be um, and as they as they pursue their goals and pursue their dreams with the help of counselors and others who are helping them move forward. And this is the tie for our third prize. Um, it's a photograph by Richard Green, who is known as mainly as a fiddle master. He has a training in classical violin and he is master of blues. But he also has a passion for photography and uh, on a cross country trip from coast to coast, he saw in Monroe, Louisiana, uh, these teenagers who were out of school and having a great time outside. And he was impressed by their spunkiness and energy and he asked if he could photograph them and they were uh, very happy about that proposal and started um, playing around and posing for the camera. And this was the result, one of the results of that, of that photo session. It was totally impromptu. And that really uh, is a wonderful image of uh, fearlessness and uh, just joy. And this photograph presents a different aspect of youth. It celebrates the involvement and leadership in civil society of, of youth. It's by Sandra Steinbrecher, a photographer who resides in Chicago. And it is, uh, it, she took it when she was photographing and documenting the march uh, of our lives in Chicago in 2018, shortly after that terrible massacre in Parkland, Florida. And she describes this moment when she looked at this young man at the center of the photograph and she experienced a very deep connection um, of uh, just through the eye contact. And uh, when she was chosen as a, as a finalist, she, through social media, she was able to find these three young people they are uh, students from Closer Career Academy. Actually, they just graduated. She built a relationship with them. She just photographed their graduation and they're probably listening right now. We're thrilled um, to represent them in the portrait gallery. And just in closing, uh, we have two more slides. I wanted to point out these two paintings, which are among the more traditional academic paintings in the exhibition and we do want to always embrace traditional academic portraiture as we move towards uh, more conceptual notions of portraiture. Here on the left you see a portrait titled TZ and profile by New Haven based artist Jenny Dubnow of her friend 
and on the right, a portrait of the a very prominent artist, John Ahern, who is based in New York and has worked in the South Bronx for many decades by his mentee, Devon Rodriguez. And what I love about this portrait is that John Ahern entered a portrait of Devon, which was um, a double cast portrait, a plaster cast in our 2016 competition. And that inspired Devon to then enter a portrait of John Ahern. So there's sort of beautiful synergy, synergy between the 2016 and 2019 uh, competitions through this um, honoring of a mentor and a mentee. And finally, to close, we decided to, to close with this work uh, because it sort of encapsulates um, one of the main questions um, of the show that emerged just from the selection of artworks itself. So it's very different from, from another kind of show where we start with the topic and, and start thinking about the work. This one really, this time with the poetry competition, the, 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 the themes emerge from the works that come to us, it's a different kind of process and equation. And this is a video self-portrait by Natalia Garcia Clark, who is uh, uh, an artist from Mexico City who works between Los Angeles and her natal city. And it's a, a portrait that stands at the verge of landscape and portraiture. Um, this is just a still from it. It's a seven minute portrait, but what you see when the portrait starts is a blank screen with the question, how many steps will it take from, from me to disappear from your, from your view? And then she enters the space right in front of us and she walks away from us into the distance. And so it's a conceptual portrait that really uh, brings to our attention how it is important to be aware of everyone's circumstances as much as we can, of course, it's, that's a very idealistic viewpoint, but of course, um, but it brings to mind how much we need to consider everyone's circumstances with humanity and with um, a sense of social care and love and responsibility in order to coexist in the planet. And we're happy to announce that the exhibition will travel um, when it closes at the end of August at the National Portrait Gallery. It will then go to the Michelle and Donald Damore Museum of Fine Arts in Springfield, Massachusetts, where it will open on October 3rd and will be on view until April 4th, 2021. So if you live nearby, you will have a chance to see it there. From there, it will go to the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum in St. Louis, where it will open on September 10th, 2021 and close on January 23rd, 2022. So I hope that if you were unable to see the exhibition at the Portrait Gallery, you'll have a chance to see it in one of these locations if you live nearby. Thank you. Thank you so much for this fascinating presentation, Dorothy and Tainia. I learned so much. Um, just wanted to say good afternoon to everyone. I'm Deborah Heller with the Friends of the Smithsonian, and I really hope you enjoyed the presentation today. I have the privilege of asking our curators some of the questions you sent in throughout the presentation. And I wanted to start by asking you both, um, does the jury use a specific criteria when selecting the winner? It's a great question. Um, I'll take a stab at it. I, I have watched the winner be selected for three competitions and each time it was unanimous. Okay. And in fact, from the very beginning of the jurying process, I think those works were, you know, rising to the top. Um, so the, but the criteria overall, and some people have asked, how do you judge work in different media against each other? we are looking for work that will hold a wall in the National Portrait Gallery that's, you know, museum quality work, work that represents a mastery over the chosen medium. So the artist has really learned to um, use their materials to the, you know, the height of those, the, that, you know, has really mastered that. 
process. And then we also really look for work that, that speaks to a range of approaches to portraiture. Tayana, what would you say? Yes, absolutely. Just what you said, and also that we look for work that, um, that conveys a strong message. And, um, and that makes a work rise to the top. Uh, when whatever the artist wants to evoke or convey comes across um, in subtle or direct ways, but it's there and it's identifiable and it moves you, you know you have a strong work of art. Excellent. We actually did have a question specifically um, about medium, um, which was that um, this viewer was seeing an inkjet print um, by what looks like photographs. Um, and she was asking, is this how you get a photo from digital photography? Did the artist print the photos themselves? And is this considered part of the artistic process? Um, are there choices involved as a painter would selecting between oil and watercolor? And just if you could speak to that. Inkjet print is a method of printing for contemporary photography, um, but it's not the only one. We had, um, for example, in this portrait competition, one of the finalist works was a collodium, collodium plate print, uh, which is a 19th century printing technique. Um, sometimes the artist, uh, with these sort of historic artisanal processes, they print the photographs themselves, but it's very often they print them uh, at, at specialized studios um, that specialize in art printing. And so inkjet is one of those printing techniques. What, what was the second part of the question? Sorry. Yeah, this, the second part of the question was um, if the artists print their photos themselves and just sort of a bit more about that process. Do they have a team helping them? Right, so sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, in, you know, in the case of contemporary photography, it's common for us at the Portrait Gallery to uh, consider photographs that sometimes are printed by the artist if they're silver gel gelatin prints, for example. And I'm not a curator of photography, I'm <laughs> specializing in painting and sculpture, but just, uh, but we have these curatorial conversations with our colleagues at the Department of Photographs. And so there's a variety of printing techniques. Okay, fascinating. Um, another question is many of the pieces are so relevant, especially in light of the Black Lives Matter movement. Any thought in putting these together in an exhibition um, on the movement? Well, it's um, a great question. We often um, are inspired to put together exhibitions by the artists who show in the outwind. And as we work to address the current moment in our museum, many of these artists um, are ones who we will consider um, showing again, who we will consider commissioning. There are actually works in the exhibition that we may acquire for the collection. So uh, yes, it's a wonderful question and we're grateful to these artists for inspiring us to um, to address the current moment um, by further working with them. Excellent. Um, another question actually was, when will you put out the call for the 2022 exhibition? The call will come out uh, very soon, early this fall. So we're very excited about that. We're just ironing out the details of uh, that, what that will look like. We're very excited. Every portrait competition is, um, every cycle process is incredibly, um, it's invigorating, you know, because um, portraiture is such an old artistic tradition, but it becomes new every three years at the Portrait Gallery, I feel. And so uh, we know that we're about to undertake the next cycle and we're all very excited. And I'm particularly excited to, to have learned from and collaborated with Dorothy Moss on this portrait competition that she has directed three times. And I will direct the next one and we'll co-curate it with Leslie Oreña, our associate creator of photographs. Wonderful. Well, I just wanted to thank you both for joining us and for sharing so many of the captivating pieces 
in the Outland 2019 American Portraiture Today. Um, your insights into the competition really brought this show to life on our computer screens. I did have the privilege of seeing it in person um, and being able to see it, you know, with your descriptions really added a new level. So we appreciate that. Um, and until we're able to visit the galleries again in person, I would just like to direct everyone to the National Portrait Gallery's website where you can view the entire show um, because we only saw just some of the portraits in this competition. So you can see them at portraitcompetition.si.edu as well as many other works of art in the museum's collection at mpg.si.edu. And I just wanted to thank you all so much for joining us today and for your invaluable support as a Friends of the Smithsonian member. You really make everything we do possible and we appreciate the time and the chance to, to share so much of what we do with you. So thank you. And thank you again to Dorothy Antoinia.